Good morning, everyone. It, it's great to be here with you. I brought two sermons. Decided that God's Spirit needed to decide which one, and, and he did. So we're ready to go. I just want to say that uh, I, it's very obvious that people have been praying. I know when, you know, when I left, boy, it's January now because things got extended several months. So it's been, it's been, it'd be nine months coming up when I left to take up the, uh, the responsibility with the, with the church in uh, Indiana. And um, you all surrounded me and sent me off with blessings and laying on of hands and your prayers. And I can tell that, you know, you've been praying off, I'm sure obviously not every time you pray, but it's, it's been on your minds enough that it's very evident in the results. They are, they are beyond what would naturally, even, it, when, even the natural course of things going well. And, you know, I've been around long enough to recognize when, when that God-infused blessing hits, and, and it is definitely uh, upon them and uh, just an absolutely wonderful situation. Um, they have a lot yet to do, and uh, they will do it without me. I'm sure they will succeed, and Mark uh, Vincent will remain, <clears throat> and uh, other people come along behind and uh, fulfill the process. But uh, that same, you, do you remember when, when in, now some of you weren't here, but some of the, a few, about half were, when we were working through kind of the who are we as a church, do you remember that time when it just kind of, like it fell from heaven and just boing and the, and it was clear they had that moment and and it just this is like they're they're you know it's it's just wonderful to see uh, that song I couldn't help but it bring back a lot of memories <laughs> and uh, you know uh, I saw probably on Facebook and I haven't had a chance to respond yet but in case any of you didn't see it our little Brenda had a birthday a couple of days ago so oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. And uh, what a voice, and what a what a wonderful person, and what a wonderful time that was, you know. Uh, I listened to that. I listened to that incredible bass in that, and I thought, who? Was, and I knew who it was, but I thought, you know, I couldn't pull that sound out of that. I think God blessed our desire for that time and the need for encouragement that we had, and He just kind of did a Israelites in the wilderness thing where He took what little we had and enhanced it somewhat, and and of course, uh, I don't know if you had to enhance, enhance Rick's engineering capability because there's an awful lot of post-production beauty put into that. But nonetheless, you have to have something to start with. And, and God certainly just, uh, you know, I listen to that and, I, and, I, and it's, uh, it's just, I couldn't do that. Couldn't just walk up and do that any old time that, that way and that well, that effectively. So God's hands are in everything. Okay, folks, sometimes, actually, off and on throughout the history of our history as the body of Jesus Christ, um, we have been hijacked by the world. And the number of ways is diverse and numerous. And hence, you know, we even have, if, if you say, well, what do you mean? And how can you say that? Well, I'm not saying it. Jesus Christ says it. And if you want to, I don't have time to do it, but if you want to take a tour to see just how many ways just take a tour through the, through the messages from the angel to the Holy Spirit to the seven churches, which are, in some ways, they're historical, actual congregations. In another way, they are a composite of the body of Christ throughout time. And you'll find as you go through, every last one of them, you know, even the one that's supposed to not have any problems, he was pointing out problems. And in quite a few of them, he was saying, look, you have been hoodwinked, sidetracked, hijacked, uh, 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 co-opted, deceived by the world in this way. Sometimes it was, you've, you've, you've adopted beliefs that are contrary to me. You've accepted the doctrines of the Nicolaitans. And we get all weirded out trying to figure out who the Nicolaitans so we can legalistically figure out that belief and be sure we don't believe that. Well, that kind of misses the point. <laughs> Okay, and then you get like to the Thyatirans and he says, look guys, you, you guys are in bed with Jezebel. You're cohabiting with somebody else. You know, I'm your spouse and you're cohabiting with someone else. That's pretty serious. 
That's a pretty serious level of deceit and or self-deceit or co-opt, etc. Well, this, this message I've talked about off and on in, in the last few times I've been here that it's an important issue, and that's the issue of judgment. I said we needed a sermon on it. Well, today's the day. I, may, I think I even talked about it in an expanded form, but this is a thought through uh, scriptural uh, uh, an, uh, inspection of the, of the t- issue. Okay? One of, the, one of the things you'll see out on the internet today that's kind of, to me, a poster for this kind of thing is you'll see this, uh, don't judge others, this is a big slogan, you know, don't judge others who sin differently than you do. That's all over the internet. I mean, people have borrowed it and shared it and stuck it on their Facebook page and, you know, it's, it's everywhere. Don't judge others who sin differently than you do. This sermon was really catalyzed into more than an interest and a, and a hmm. It was catalyzed into this is something we've got to grapple with actually by uh, children of mine who remain unnamed who in discussions would say, Dad, you're being judgmental. And I'd scratch my head and I'd think, I think I'm naming a sin. I don't mean to be judgmental. I don't mean to be condemning a person, but I am naming a sin. Dad, you're judging them. Okay, well, how am I judging them? Would I, should I pretend? What, what do you want me to do? You know? And I began to realize, of course, it wasn't just my offspring. That just was the one conversation that catalyzed it, that, uh, that especially our younger generation, and by that I don't mean school kids, I mean 40s and under, are infected with this idea that we must not judge one another. Or we must, and therefore, we must not be judge, the, the noun form of that, the chronic form, judge mental. We must not have a mind that, of judging. Okay? Now, uh, when we speak of someone who is judging others all the time, we refer to them as judgmental. And in, but in, in modern English, in our, in our usage, the word judgmental is not a neutral term, is it? It's, it's, a, major, it's a majorly detrimental term. You are bad, you're, you're wrong if you're judgmental in this society. Uh, it contains a, heavy, a, a negative bias. So, but, but you know what's interesting is one can say, or it's true, that this bias is supported directly from Scripture. People who know the Bible, who also, like my offspring, who would say, Dad, you're being judgmental, would quote the scripture to me, don't judge others. The Bible says, judge not that you be not judged. That's the well, there's a Romans passage and then there's a Matthew passage and one says that, one adds that and the other one does not. They both say though, don't, don't judge. Uh, you too will be judged, the Matthew passage you quoted, for in the same way you judge others, you will be judged and with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Now, from the Apostle James, do you have the ability to, uh, if this new thing, just throw a scripture up there? Okay. I'm spoiled. I'm s- uh, no, we did, but not now. I, I started doing things, everything like we used to, putting it on a stick and all. They said, don't put it on a stick, just give us your notes and whew, it's up there. And, okay. Well, so I'll read it too. In, in, the, in the book of James, chapter 4, beginning in verse 11, we find another scripture that essentially says the same thing. Brothers and sisters... Do not slander one another. Now the assumption, at least in, in, in when that term is used in this way, is that that judgmental, being judgmental is a putting down. It is a form of slander. It is a criticism. It's an, it is an un, uh, unwarranted, unauthorized criticism. So it says, anyone who speaks against a brother or sister judges them, speaks against the law, and judges it. When you judge the law... You are not keeping it, but sitting in judgment of it. That's verse 11. If we had this up here, I'd ask you to read verse 12 together with me, which says, there is only one lawgiver and judge. There's only one. The one who is able to save and to destroy. But you, who are you to judge your neighbor? Now, that's pretty hardcore and pretty plain that we're not to be judging our brother or our sister. 
It really gives a, a, a large kind of uh, support, uh, you know, framework to this idea of don't judge others who sin differently than you do. And it kind of leaves the door open for whatever my sin is, we all sin, it's different from your sin, and therefore the assumption can very easily be that one sin cancels out another sin, and therefore none of us can talk about either of them. That's the assumption. I got this sin, so I can't judge you. I mean, I see you've got this sin, and I would want to name that and say, you shouldn't be doing this, but I've got this sin, so I can't name your sin because I have a sin, and you can't name mine, because, and so what happens? Yes. And what happens, okay, now I'll give you a little bit of head start where, where my concern is as we get further, as we get toward the conclusion. Okay, if the world who is full of sin does that to one another, it's not helpful. Nobody's, nobody's being helped to grow, but at least, you know, it's, it's in the area, it's in the, it's in the uh, segment of society that's already blinded. But when the body of Christ that is put there to be salt and light goes silent and invisible, what is its worth? Nothing. Right. Okay. So our understanding of this issue must grow out of a heart that is committed to our Father in heaven. And Matthew 7, what we just read, is a key to understanding if we're to have the Lord's heart. Now, the problem of judging, okay, Jesus in this passage in Matthew 7 is not referring to a courtroom setting. He's referring to a uh, relational setting. He's referring to a family setting, a church setting, a community setting where people are basically peers and where the, where the conversation turns toward uh, judge, judgmental, uh, takes a judgmental uh, uh, direction. He is talking about that. A courtroom, let's talk about a courtroom for a moment though because it's a very good basis for our understanding. The courtroom is about discerning good from evil, isn't it? Yeah. It's about discerning right from wrong, fact from fiction. Uh, the courtroom is not talking, or Jesus is not talking about that. He's talking about the hasty, unloving, holier-than-thou, self-righteous, uh, and by the way, this is at the very heart of gossip and uh, tail-bearing and this kind of thing. Uh, and you saw, you see, when you see the, the setting Jesus had around him, he was talking to people who loved to follow him around and judge who he ate with, judge who he spoke to, judge who he let worship him in the manner in which they let worship him, judge whether his disciples adequately washed their hands before dinner. I mean, you're getting, we're getting pretty, pretty, you know, and leaping to conclusions which were condemning in nature. That was the setting he was, he was talking about. He was not talking about the situation in a courtroom. And we're, when we're in a courtroom, it's interesting that our own human system has captured at least in principle, has captured this differentiation. You have, in a, in a full trial, as our, as our system allows for, you have two components, right? You have a judge sitting on the bench, and you have, over in the box, a jury made up of peers, a jury of peers, okay? And they have two totally different, uh, two totally different roles in a jury trial. Now sometimes it's waived and certain kinds of things the judge does both, but bear with me for the sake of this analogy. The jury's job is to hear the facts as they are presented by the, by the prosecution and by the defense. And when all has been heard and reviewed and rebutted back and forth until it's come, everybody rests, the jury goes into a, their private room and what do they do? And what do they come out with? They decide. They come out with a verdict, which is a decision of guilt or innocent based on the facts. They don't condemn the prisoner or the, the, the defendant. They assess and render a decision based on assessment. The judge, on the other hand, takes the verdict in hand and proceeds to, we even use the word, 
the prisoner or the, 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 the so-and-so was condemned to life in prison or was condemned to serve so many years hard labor, right? That word isn't as much, used as much as, as it used to be. It used to be the, the term for the judge passing sentence. And so in, in terms of judging, there are, there are two different distinct types of judging. And what we're focusing on right now is the condemning where it is not authorized, okay? And, it's, and in, in order to understand this, we need to really think back and bring into the picture Genesis, the third chapter, the good old two trees of the knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life. And people were told, don't take of these trees. The serpent did his job. Eve took of the tree and ate the fruit. So did Adam. And the whole thing behind this, the whole thing behind our being lost and the whole plan of redemption that, that we worship and remember every time we gather is to restore this brokenness. And what was at the heart and the core of that brokenness? It was that what came into us and as a, as a, as a, as a creation uh, and has stayed through Adam and Eve right on down to us and our children is a, if left to ourselves, we will take the final right of judgment, of, of determining what is right or what is wrong unto ourselves. And in this country, God bless us and bless all, thank you for all the incredible blessings. But one of the things that we have done that's part of our heritage is to take that and amplify it clear out into outer space. And our individuality and our rights, and we'll fight for our rights. And you have no right to tell me that. And I, rights this, rights that, rights the other thing. We worship our rights. And that's great in many ways because it protects our freedom. But in this particular way, it can cause us to be like one of the situations of the churches in Revelation 3 and be co-opted right into a very dangerous uh, frame of mind and course of action. Okay? When, and so the sin is when we are judging others in the role of that judge sitting on the bench... What we are saying, even though we would deny it to high heaven because it's not conscious, it's, it's underneath. And when it's brought, when, when somebody would say this to you, you'd say, no living way. But what's really happening when we are engaging in this kind of judgment is that we are in assuming for ourselves and the other person that we have the mind of Jesus Christ in saying what we're saying. And they don't. So we are taking unto ourselves not only, not only our right to decide, but we are saying in judging someone else in this way, Jesus said, do not do. We are stepping into the place of Jesus Christ when we're not authorized to do that. And that is the problem of judging. And it is so onerous and it takes place so much that yes, we, we ourselves grew up you know, being very against this kind of behavior. And our younger generation, it seems to be amplified. And so there is, a, there is something that's even greater than the Constitution that says, you're judging. Uh, it's so funny. I was listening to National Public Radio shortly after I was, began putting these points together. I was driving down the road, and here was a, there was a talk show. It was in the evening. And, it <laughs> and I don't even know what it was about, but... And the, per, the woman just started out. She said, okay. She said, here we are. And of course, NPR radio is, is extremely liberal and extremely inclusive and, you know, open and would never judge. <laughs> this woman starts out and says, okay. So I'm setting down the rules. There's no haters, no. And she listed off about four or five things. She says, what? She says one word out of your mouth, we cut, we cut them off because we don't have any of those in there. And I thought, wow. I have not heard a more serious case of judge, a pre-judgment. You know, first person hasn't called in. And you've, you've already lined it out. And, and, and I thought, th this is a judgmental, non-judgmental program. <laughs> you know? so, we can become so we can become so overboard about not being judgmental that we actually become more judgmental than others. It's crazy. Uh, we can sin so many different directions, and it's the same sin. You know, there was a, there was a fellow a while back who was a reporter for a, for a, 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 ma a major magazine. And he, was, he had went, went down to the southern United States, and he was planning to do an article kind of about the laid-back kind of laziness, of, you know, implied laziness of the South and how things are slower there and, and all this kind of stuff. So he was out looking for 
uh, pictures and 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 you know things he could use as illustrations. And he 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 was driving along and he looked out in this one field and he just said, "Oh man, Eureka! It does not get any better than this." Because here was this field, and out in the middle of the field was this guy, and he had he had a, a, a lawn chair, and he was kicked back in this lawn chair with a hoe. And he, he was he was weeding, we, he was doing weeds like this. So the guy stopped the car and he got his camera and he got out into that field to get some pictures. And on his uh, you know uh, on his way back he uh, he just thought, man, this is this is gonna this is gonna get me a Pulitzer Prize. This really does it. And as he drove off, he looked he was had moved a little bit and he looked over his shoulder one more time, and he had a different angle and he saw that the guy didn't have any legs. <laughs> the article switched from being about the laziness of the South to a story of courage and did come out and, you know, very successful. You know, the Indians say that before we judge, we need to walk a mile in the other person's moccasins. So the thing is, we can't know what each of us is dealing with. We can't know. You know, you look at someone where they are and you can make a judgment based on your, uh, uh, our, our world and our history and everything and we, we don't know where they started. We don't know what God thinks about this. We, I might be looking at someone and I think, boy, you know, you're just, you barely got your nose above water. And the thing is, I started with my nose above water and have maybe, you know, uh, maybe have grown a foot. Whereas they started at the bottom, not even breathing and are already coming out of the water. What does God look at? So this is the problem with judging. And Romans, the passage in Romans uh, goes on to uh, elaborate that even more. So, uh, if we could see things as God sees them, many times, sometimes, yes, we would see evil or wrong just as God sees evil or wrong. But other times where we see something in we're critical or down, down putting, if I can use that term, if we could see it through God's eyes, it, it, it would, we would marvel instead of condemn. And that is the problem with judgment, being judgmental. That is the evil. That is the part, that is what's to be avoided. There is no right part of it. It is fully wrong. And, you know, if I can quote from 1 Samuel 16, <clears throat> um, the Lord said unto Samuel, when he's, this is when they were, uh, he sent them to anoint a king, and he went through all of Jesse's sons, and there was one that was so, you know, he was such a ratty little guy and so nothing that they didn't even consider him in the ballpark with the others, so they didn't even invite him. But God told him, get the other guy in here, and they waited till he came. And then God said to Samuel, do not consider his appearances or his height, speaking of the other guys, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at things as people look. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And the problem is the Lord has not given me or you the vision into one another's heart as deeply as it needs to be to always be accurate. And so we can make, we can, and we can do great damage with our, mouth, with our tongues <clears throat> uh, and our behavior when we assume and take the authority of Jesus Christ in assuming that we can, okay? Uh, continuing with Jesus' teaching in Matthew 7. Now he talks about the, the specks and the planks. He goes on to say, why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there's a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First, take the plank out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Now, the pharisaical righteousness was not just self-righteous. It was, I mean, it was not just hypercritical. The, the problem was, it was two-faced. It was two-faced. Uh, Luke 18, as uh, you know, Jesus illustrates the, the Pharisee going up to pray and at the same time condemning as a total scumbag somebody else who was there to pray because they didn't match the Pharisee's idea of righteousness. Uh, he was saying, you know, Lord, I thank you. I'm not like this poor scumbag over here. And at the same time, the implication was, God, you're so blessed to have me on your side. It's two-faced. He couldn't see that in the eyes of God, he was just as much a scumbag as the person next to him. 
And that in the eyes of God, when justified through the blood of Christ, the scumbag was every bit, you know, a, 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 an asset to God as the Pharisee thought that he was. And so it doesn't say that, you know, in this, 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 this parable, it wasn't saying that there wasn't actually a speck in the person's eye. And he wasn't saying that it didn't, be, it didn't need to be removed. You see, it, it, was, it wasn't like, if you don't judge, there's no sin. No, it really was a speck. It really needed to be removed. That wasn't the point. The point was, you got this much larger thing in your own eye. You're being two-faced about it. You need to deal with that. Then go remove the speck. Then you're in a position. So wrong judging makes us feel better. Okay, it makes us feel better. Furthermore, it distracts my attention from my own sin. That's kind of what, was, what, what Jesus is, is, is saying here. If I, if I can see your speck, I can distract myself to where I can't even see my plank. And that's the wrong kind of judging. And, and, if, and if I focus on your sin, I will even find myself ignoring that over which I do have control in my own life. And I'll use your sin as a justification not to repent of my own or not to grow in some area. You know, uh, the, the, the year, but, we, but we have to watch out because if we do not, if we don't exercise the other kind, you know, it, it, if we don't, um, let me just make sure, I think I had a, a particular thing I wanted to include here. Yeah, so the thing is that we have to now switch gears is, is that just as this is a, there's a mortal danger in, in wrong judging, there is a mortal danger in not judging. And that's the part that I feel like our younger generation has missed. It's been co-opted. We've been hijacked, uh, brainwashed to thinking that there's only, that judging is judging is judging. It's all this kind that we don't, we shouldn't be doing is sin. We're condemning, we've talked about and that, that's all there is. If you're judging at all, that's what you're doing. And that's the dangerous, equally sinful thought. And we have to help somehow our young people process this. If we do not judge, we're in line to have a lobotomy. May as well have one. You're judging, you know, if, if that's wrong as an act, as I said, it cancels everything out and therefore everything's okay. Don't judge others who sin differently than you do. So what we've done is gone from a harsh, critical spirit, which is wrong, to the opposite extreme, which is permissiveness. And is a key accelerator. And here I go, I'm on my soapbox again about what happens when a society loses sight of God and the ability to come, come back to God. But this is a key accelerator in that process. It's a key accelerator. That, and, and, and actually causes us to begin to lose knowledge of God and its consequences when we just cancel everything out so you can't think about it because you're judging if you do. Here's Jesus' concluding teaching on this subject and it's fascinating because Jesus himself sees this and switches gears. A lot of people think this isn't connected to what we read before but it's part of the same parable, same passage, it's just the next verse. And Jesus is giving the other side. His concluding teaching says, do not give dogs what is sacred. And do not throw your pearls to pigs. If you do, they may trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. Now, we all know that. It's not very familiar. We cite that. We, and we cite it as reasons why we don't do something or do do something. And we're very, we're very good about that. But, how do, but have we ever connected that to this whole issue of judgment discerning? Jesus doesn't end his discussion of judging with the command, judge not. He goes on to say, don't give, don't, don't do this other. And it requires some kind of criteria, right? If it says, don't throw, if I'm going to not throw my, uh, give to the dogs what's sacred or, or throw my pearls before swine, how am I going to know the difference between a swine and a dog and a cow and a sheep and, a, and those if we do not exercise judgment? Judgment parentheses, discernment, okay? Jesus is acknowledging the need to make decisions and discernments. Well, first of all, discernments are awarenesses, and they're followed by decisions which shape our behavior, okay? That is, and and we, we are to do these things concerning people, concerning beliefs, concerning every aspect of our life as it impacts 
you know, our walk with God. Every behavior that is detrimental to our Christian lives, he is not condemning all judging. In fact, he demands that we make judgments. In fact, you go on to John, uh, the seventh chapter, verse 24, he says, stop judging. Now I see the, the, that, <laughs> that national public program would say that's, that is full stop right there. But that's not what it says. It says, stop judging by mere appearances. Okay? But instead, don't judge. No. It says, instead, judge correctly. What is correctly? Correctly is using the standards and the criteria of Jesus Christ himself while ourselves being in a position of humility where we are not usurping that right. We're recognizing that that we are not that, but we're using that as, so, so that, pre, that prevents us from switching over into the condemning mode because we, we start from the point that we too are sinners. So we're not, ju we're not condemning judging, but we are discerning. And that's what I tried to get across to my, to my daughter. You know what's right and wrong? She said, yes. I said, if you do not discern in between those two in coming in your life as you, as you walk through and situations come to you, then how are you going to retain that knowledge? Mm. And we had, a, we had a really good conversation then, it was, and it was a very, very good one. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 2. Do you not know that the Lord's people will judge the world? And if you are to judge the world, are you not competent to judge trivial matters? Trivial cases? 1 Corinthians 6, verse 3. Do, not, do you not know that we will judge angels? How much more the things of life? 1 Corinthians 6, 5. I say this to shame you. Is it possible that there is nobody among you wise enough to judge a dispute between believers? The only way that we can retain the knowledge of God in a sinful world is if we are constantly and vigilantly discerning and judging between right and wrong. Right? There even comes a situation where we are told to judge matters within the church. And if necessary, exclude someone based on their behavior. But we are never authorized to look at that person, whether it's a brother or sister in the church who might be under discipline, or whether it is someone in the world. We are never authorized to look at that person as worthless or as being outside God's grace. And that is the key. And we can only... We can only maintain that position of being on our knees with our hands up ready to receive and then offer if we are, if we recognize on the one hand our, the difference between God and us and our, uh, that's, where the, that's where the humility comes from and then the confidence comes from recognizing what he is making us. But it's only from that position that we can do this consistently and do it correctly. So in this crazy world of don't judge others who sin differently from you, we have to avoid the self-righteous, we have to avoid the critical, but we do not overlook sin. Jesus never did. Sin is always sin, and we are always ready to extend the grace of Jesus Christ to the sinner. The conclusion, I'd like to just take us back to the woman taken in adultery. She refused to look down, you know, she, she, she was brought in there as already, you know, guilt was already proven, so to speak, and they brought her in to be condemned by, uh, under the law. And Jesus being the rabbi was the one that they, it was all a setup, but that's what their, their expectation was, that he would exercise the law and condemn her. Instead, he didn't, did he? He refused to look down on her. The thing is, he refused to treat her as a thing. Regardless of her state of sinfulness or righteousness, little bit of sin, huge sin, little bit righteous, you know, right up there with the apostles, he did not consider that. He considered her a person. He considered her a daughter. He considered her someone he loved and would give his life for. And from that starting point, he then made the mob or, and the leaders thereof consider their own sin. 
And one by one, they disappeared. And then he had the woman face her sin. He didn't say it doesn't matter. He didn't say, oh, well, it's not really sin, you know. It's, or, well, I, you know, I came so you don't need to worry. I came and I'm going to give my life so you don't need to worry about it. He didn't do any of those things. He made her face it. And he forgave her. Just that, just that simple. That is a really good way for us to approach it. You know, Jesus challenged her to stop, uh, stop sinning. And Jesus will do the same thing for us this morning and any day in our own lives. If we come to him, he will not condemn. If there are others, you know, against us, he will work with them in his own way and time to consider, <laughs> consider their own sins. He will cause us to face our sin and then he will forgive and if necessary, restore. And that's the way that, you know, Jesus works. It doesn't he? And is that not the way that we should, in our following him, that we should work? So when it comes to judgment, we never sit, we never climb up into the bench, of the bench of the judge. We're constantly a member of the jury. And when we run into it, we never treat that which is wrong or the people in that if it's a class we're talking about, like some class of behavior in society, we never denigrate or, or, or in the way that we talk about them or think about them, we do not make them things. Because that's just, that's just ignoring the problem. But rather, we always treat them as beloved people of, Jesus, of, who, you know, of God's children. And if possible, we help them face and then we forgive and restore.